Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. So my interview today is with Nathan Fitch. He's a documentarian out of New York who was recently at Hot Docs with his new film, Island Soldier. It's a film, it's a documentary about Micronesian citizens that are serving in the U.S. military. And by now, some of you are saying, where, pray tell, is Micronesia? All the more reason why you need to see the film, and you should listen uh, to the interview coming up with Nathan. We talk uh, a whole lot about, uh, again, a whole lot of things. We talk about his film. We talk about why he was uh, pulled into the project in the first place. But more importantly, we talk about the community of uh, young men and women who are serving in the U.S. military, who are coming back to... Something that they, I think in a way we can say that they probably didn't expect. We talk about war, we talk about colonialism, and we talk about family and community and second class citizens and what it means to share everything. We get into a little bit of geopolitics and geography and and why Nathan fell in love with Micronesia. So uh, I think you're going to enjoy the interview, you're going to enjoy the film. It's it's coming up. Uh, Nathan talks a little bit about that, uh, but is also kind of secretive about where it's going to be showing next. But uh, stay tuned, islandsoldiermovie.com. And don't forget, davidpecklive.com for more information about my podcasting, writing, and speaking. And you can get behind Face to Face through patreon.com. And don't forget, rabble.ca as well for more information about my own podcasting and, and others as well. Coming right up, Nathan Fitch and Island Soldier. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We're joined by a very special guest today, another uh, documentarian, a hot docs documentarian. Uh, Nathan Fitch is here with us to talk about his new film, Island Soldier. Uh, Nathan, thanks, uh, thanks for your time today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Direct, direct from New York, New York City. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Very nice. So, let, why don't we just jump right in? Tell me, tell me a little bit about uh, uh, the the buzz of of hot dogs. Are you st- are you still coming down from that a little bit? Uh, wh- wh- what was what was the experience like? Yeah. So, <clears throat> so hot dogs was our international premiere and was pretty incredible. We had three screenings uh, over the course of the festival, and they were all really good um after laboring on a film for a while I, I have to say it was like really incredible to see it in a theater projected with really good sounds like the uh stiff light box really kind of mind-blowing mm. after having watched watched it kind of like grow on monitors and you know various devices for years right. so, right. so it was great and it was uh you know it was amazing to be kind of surrounded by the, the quality and breadth of films that were presented at this year's Hot Docs. So, you know, speaking for myself and my team, it was, uh, was an honor. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Any, any, um, so you must have had, you had three Q&As, any, and then that was, we're about to dig into some, some questions here about, about the film and about sort of, I guess, the bigger picture and the metaphor of it all. But, but uh, any, any questions stand out for you? Um, you know, it, it was interesting. I, th- I think there's like a certain, there's certain questions that the film seems to like bring up in sure. audiences. Yeah. Um, and one thing, so, so Hot Docs was our, our international premiere, but we had had our world premiere about three weeks earlier at a festival called Full Frame in North Carolina. And because there's a number of military bases around uh, that festival, I, I had posted something on Facebook and a, quite a number of Micronesians who were serving in the military sort of found out about the screening and were able to come, come to the Q&A, come oh, okay. to the screening, and also take part in the Q&A. And I think that, you know, like one thing that I, I would have loved to sort of interject into the hot docs 
screenings would have been to have the voices of the people we're representing mm-hmm. uh, also be able to kind of like uh, speak to the, the film and the themes. And I think a lot of the questions that I was responding to at Hot Docs were kind of, you know, how did you come to the story? How did you get to Afghanistan? Things of that nature. And yep. I, I think that those questions are, I love to talk about that stuff, but I also, um, you know, in that screening context, really enjoyed having the people who were who are being represented and whose kind of life, you know, part of their life narrative is represented in some way. Well, is it, and, the film. and isn't that kind of why you make a film like this in the first place? Right. And I mean, I think like Micronesia is a place that not a lot of people know about, right? It's, uh, it's been referenced a few times, like Zoolanders, you know, the sort of blockbuster film, like, referenced it. And, you know, like, for another generation, for my, my grandparents, both, both of my grandparents served in the military. Both of them, uh, you know, were enlisted or were, you know, were serving during World War II. And for them, Micronesia was a very important place. Like, my, my father's father was you know, sailed through Micronesia on his way to Japan and was, like, wounded in the heart with a piece of shrapnel, like, in Okinawa. And for him, those islands had, like, a resonance and an importance. But I think now it's, like, a place that's, that's easy to not know about. So I think, you know, there's there's also a colonial history and, and you know, ideas of representation. It feels like a very important topic in, in documentary. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I think, uh, I'm happy to, to speak to my sort of experience of making the film, um, but have also been very happy with the reception of the film by the people we're representing. It's so, it's so interesting. I mean, one of the things that stood out to me was the, just the, 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 the idyllic settings. I mean, the establishing shots, the, the, you've got moments throughout the film that are, I mean, it's, it's stunning photography. It's, it's, and by the way, congratulations <laughs> on, on the Thank film you. and, and hot docs and all of that. It's, it's really quite a, quite a remarkable thing. And, and I, and I have a huge amount of respect for, for the, the, the effort, the time, the passion, the commitment, and all of that, um, but yeah, this this unbelievably beautiful place, and yet you know, it's it's like I guess anywhere in the world when you start to peel back a layer or two, uh, stories emerge, and and, right. and this is you know an easy like you say this is an easy place to not know about you know who's who the heck has heard about Micronesia, so right, but but, but to kind of speak to that, so the way I, I did come to the narrative was. After I finished undergrad, I had been studying at a art school in California and had been working incredibly hard. Um, and I, to some degree, burned out and to some degree decided I didn't want to work in the kind of industry in L.A. that felt like it was going to be where I, I could go. Right. Um, and so I, 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 enlist, or I, I applied and was accepted into the Peace Corps. And after a few kind of false starts where I was offered a position somewhere and then accepted and then was gone, uh, got Micronesia as kind of my right. assignment. Okay. Um, and so I have kind of a vivid memory uh, sitting in a coffee shop kind of flipping through this manual that the Peace Corps had sent me and kind of being like, you know, really know nothing about this, you know, part of the world. And to be totally honest at that point, was not terrifically interested in the Pacific as a region. Right kind of had some sort of stereotypes of, like, South Pacific uh, musical films and, like, grass skirts and, like, just sort of didn't, at that point, understand how complex and interesting and kind of amazing the, right. uh, the culture and the people were, um, but deciding to kind of go. And the thing that kind of hooked me right away was kind of the natural beauty of these mm. islands. I mean, mm. you kind of step off, step off the plane and you're kind of hit with this, like, incredibly warm air that's full of all, you know, the scents of, uh, like, flowering trees, and it's just a really a, a different world. And I think, you know, it was interesting. Out of the four people uh, that year that were assigned to the islands that I spent my sort of Peace Corps experience, my Peace Corps service on, I was the only one who stayed for the full oh, two years. Everyone right? else 
left for various reasons. And I think, you know, the beauty was the thing that hooked me and then sort of getting into the community was the thing that kept me for the fall. So, so the film, the film's about Micronesia. Uh, we've, it's about the military. It's, it's about, it's about a whole lot of things. Tell give us, can you give us a little bit of context before, before we go a little deeper? Sure. Like, do you want the sort of log line of the film? Yeah. Log, log line of yeah. the film and, and, and a little bit of, yeah, yeah. And maybe, maybe some of the implications for you even, and, and some of the, some of the changes that maybe you kind of went through as a, as a result of, you know, the filming. Sure. So my, so, excuse me, um, it's been kind of a long day. Uh, so Island Soldier explores the service of Micronesian citizens in the U.S. military at very high rates per capita. So non-Americans who have been enlisting in America's uh, Army, Navy, different branches of the military, um, especially since, uh, post 9-11, Micronesians were serving uh, before that, um, but, but post 9-11, with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan heating up, basically Micronesia became a recruiter's paradise. Hmm. Um, because with the end of the draft, uh, you know, people like myself with a certain amount of privilege were less eager to, to enlist. Um, and certainly... In the family I grew up in, military service was not the first uh, the first choice. So, so Island Soldier explores the journey, like what it's like to leave one of the like most remote, peaceful islands in the world um, to go from there into the military, into the U.S. military, and then to war and back again, and kind of the implications or the impact of of America's wars on these countries. Um, who have been sacrificing their, their young people at very high rates per capita. Um, they've actually been dying at a rate that's five times higher than Americans. So, so that statistic alone is a little staggering for most Americans who sort of would have no clue that this is like even a place to know that they've right. been dying, shedding their blood for us, I think. And I think, you know, to go to, you know, I, I lived in the island, you know, for a few years and sort of watch my friends uh, leave and join the military and come back. And, you know, I saw the change in them. Um, and without making any kind of judgment about if it was good or bad, I think right. at the time it was just a profound change. <clears throat> um, so that was like, in some ways, the seed of the film and also feeling the conflicted nature within the community around this, you know, around this topic, like, should our young people be going off to, to fight for America? Like, are these values in line with our, our cultural kind of priorities? Um, but somewhere along the line, I, I kind of realized that, that I had come to this place that not a lot of people knew. Um, and I was serving, I was, I was there as a Peace Corps volunteer, but they were serving in my place because I didn't want to go you know, for whatever reason, sure. to, to Iraq and Afghanistan. But I, I'm there to help their community, but really they're, they're kind of slotted in in my place because Americans like me don't want to go fight. So right. I think, you know, in terms of thinking about the impetus and at some point the responsibility for making this film, I felt like Americans at least, you know, should have some idea of where of course. these people yeah. are coming from and, and also kind of, you know some of the the challenges they face is, when they come back. And I, Nathan, yeah. is this would you would you would you describe uh, Island Soldier as an anti-war film? You know, I, I wouldn't describe it as an anti-war film. And I think one thing that has been important to me in terms of making the film has been that it's told in Micronesian voices, mm. and that I don't project too much of my own politics and my own. Uh, like political stance onto the people I'm representing. Right. Because I think, like I said, you know, they, they don't have their voice uh, heard. They don't, they don't get to be in cinema. They don't get to be on the screen very often, you know? Right. It's like, look, this, this is like, you know, whether the film, if the film had not gotten into any festivals and had only, you know, been seen back in the islands, I still think there's, there's an important 
for this com community to feel represented in the world um, and to be on YouTube or wherever the you know the video would have the film would have lived. Um, so so is it anti-war? I mean, I think I think there's a prominent voice. I think the prominent voices there's prominent voices in the film um, that are anti-war, and and there's also young young people who you know feel patriotism to to the U.S. or to the idea of the U.S. and want to you know and want to serve and want to you know contribute. And I, I think that that to me as a filmmaker, it felt like if if I had too much of an agenda, it might not be true to their kind of their experience. Uh, so. I don't know if that answers, but that yeah, was, that was, no, that was, that I you know I don't I'm not sure it is it's an I mean my from my perspective I'm not sure it's an anti-war film either, but I couldn't help but thinking about right. how 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 the perspective changed from you know one of the characters in the film I can't remember if it's uh, uh, Mario Saps's best friend and he's you know he says I I want to be an American soldier, you know, yep. and and is this yep. is about fighting for freedom and just all that sort of you know and and as a Canadian. I don't quite understand that, um, you know, that militaristic edge quite as much. My father served in the Royal Air Force, but, you know, in Canada, we just, I don't know, we just don't seem to have that ethos in the same way that Americans seem to. And so, and, and here's these, uh, you know, these Micronesian folks and families that are clearly military families raised with it right? and, and, and looking, looking forward to it in a sense. And you kind of go, wow, is that, is, is, is that really what the U.S. is exporting around the world? Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think it's a it's a complicated question, um, and I think in Micronesia, we're talking about the, a, a, you know very small islands, and <clears throat> throughout their colonial history, the people who have come in have come in with warships, right? <clears throat> um, you know, the Spanish, the German, mm. the Japanese, the Americans, and you know, different colonial rule rulers have kind of like ruled in different ways. Like right. they, the Germans when they were in Micronesia were, were kind of like more hands off and let, let, let the Islanders kind of do their thing a little more. But in general, I think it's safe to say that the Micronesians have always been second class citizens post kind of European colonialism, right? right. Like, like the people came in and they had the, the guns and kind of like had the power and I think that that's like, in terms of understanding the allure of sort of donning the military uniform, is a hard thing to discount. And even though it's been <clears throat> a long time since that happened, I think things are passed through the generations and kind of like ideas about how you look at these people. And I think one thing that kind of illustrates why for a Micronesian joining the military might have allure um, was that, as far as I've been able to sort of find in my research, the first time that Micronesians were enlisted to fight in a, a foreign military was during World War II. Right. And a, a group of, uh, of young men was enlisted from an island called Pompeii, which is about 300 miles from the island that my film, Koshrai, is sort of set on. And these young men were kind of vetted and then were, were allowed to become, you know, soldiers for the Japanese army. And until then, they had kind of been the second-class citizens who, like, you know, are serving their the controlling sort of Japanese force. And at that moment, they put on the uniform, and they were allowed to have sake for the first time. They were allowed to kind of have a gun and sort of be equals with these people who until then had been their rulers, you know. So I think if you think about it, if, if you can enlist and suddenly have – this power, you know, transferred to you that you are no longer less than, than the, the people who have colonized you. And obviously now Micronesia is an independent country, and but I think the colonial history and the kind of reverence for America and for, for Americans for liberating them from Japan, even though it's not as clearly evident in the younger generation, is definitely still felt by the people who experienced, you know... Sure. Yeah. Liberation. Yeah. Yeah. And you, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. You kind of touched on it. I can't help but think too, there's a, a sense in which some of these young guys and, and women who are, 
who who enlist, who are heading, you know, uh, are are hmm, are stepping into uh, a community. I mean, we're talking a, a community that 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 not only is attractive because of you know the the, the promo video they got to see, you know, that, right. that draws them in at the at, uh, when when they enlist and so on, but that. Wow, this is this is a group of people that I'm that I'm going to be accepted by. There, there's going to be camaraderie here. There's community here. There's a there's a team spirit, and I I I, I got that sense. I mean, Kostrai is a, a a community of about sixty five hundred people. Is that right? It's Correct. A, we're talking about a very small population, so I would imagine pretty pretty limited opportunities. No, absolutely. I mean, look, I think I think you're you're spot on with that, and I think Micronesian culture is much less individualistic. It's much more about community and kind of the sort of good of the group versus right. your own right. personal ambitions to some degree. Um, and I think in that way, the Islanders from Koshrai have, you know, in some ways the military makes sense for them ideologically. Like they sure. kind of get in and they're part of this like group and they're all working towards the same, you know, end. and I think, you know, although there's sort of a limited number of people in the film, I did a lot of interviews, and I think that that was one thing that I would say sort of resonated with subjects, the sort of idea of their service being for, for the good of the sort of group, you know? And I, I think that they related to that idea. Um, I think that it's actually a really hard transition to go from a very low, quiet place into sort of military rigor Oh, I would. Um, yeah, I would think it would be incredibly difficult. Incredibly different. Dif- you know, I when I first sort of moved there, I'd be invited to to a party, and I would show up. It, the party would be at twelve, and I would show up at you know twelve, <laughs> and no one else would come for about two hours, and then people would start trickling in with <laughs> food, and 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 I think you know for me also that was like an interesting idea, having lived in the islands and really experienced how slow and tranquil and you know, right, right. what what that would be like in a visceral sense, you know, and I would have loved to film more of that transition, but it, it's been difficult for any number of reasons. Um, but I, I think, you know, I think it's not an easy transition for that reason. It's not an easy transition because some of the young people either don't speak English so well when they're enlisted or are very shy. And, you know, there's varying kind of narratives about, like, how people are treated, right? how the Micronesians are treated, and how race and, you know, class things transition in the, you know, are, are sort of like built into the military culture. So I think, you know, like someone like Staff, the, the character who who passes away and who whose best friend kind of journeys to the island to kind of meet his family and come to peace with his own PTSD and and devils. Um, his father was in the Navy, and so he grew up sort of as a military brat. Mm-hmm. Um, but he actually almost got expelled from the military because one of his friends who was um, who was being harassed for racial reasons, um, he lashed out and, and, you know, fought with two or three white soldiers and almost got expelled until someone kind of looked into the details. So I think... You know, it's not it's not a part of the movie per se, but I think that there is, as as especially as someone coming from a country in a place no one knows about, there's like a certain, um, you know, lack of lack of regard for for who you are and like where where you're coming from that that might be less prevalent for me as like a white man going into the military. What, to what degree do you think this is about, you know, and this is, you know, never necessarily simple, but I think, you know, in the film it comes out, the average income in Micronesia is about $2,000 a year U.S., um, but, right. but but someone in the military can make probably upwards, uh, probably even higher than this, but you, I think the average was around $18,000. I mean, that's nine right. times the average uh, salary. That's, that's pretty significant. That's, I mean, that's huge, right? So that's got to be a pretty significant draw. I, I couldn't, I couldn't help but think this was, you know, kind of a little bit about the American dream as well. You know, wow, this is an opportunity for me to step outside to see the world and to come back with, you know, quite a bit of cash. 
No, absolutely. I mean, I, I think you're, you're spot on with that. And I think, you know, that is definitely a lot of the young people. And the idea, you know, this, this was a few years ago, but when I was living in Coast Drive, the governor, um, you know, a high-paid official on the island was making around $18,000 a year. So as an 18-year-old with no college education, right. you can kind of like be vaulted into the realm of one of the highest-paid right. government officials. Yeah. Um, but I think it's also kind of important to think about the cultural context of money in Micronesia. Um, you know, my the film is focused on Koh Shrai, and that's kind of where I spent the bulk of my time and know, know kind of the most about. But kind of the idea there um, is that out of every family of, you know, seven or eight people, um, one person has a job and then supports everyone else. And so I think what, what you see happening when these young people decide to enlist is not only, you know, the idea of a fat paycheck for yourself, but it's the idea of a paycheck that can be dispersed throughout your, you know, family sure. and yeah. extended family and sort of, you know, a lot of these, the vast majority of these soldiers, these Micronesian soldiers are sending home um, money in a way that I, I think as an American soldier, you probably, if you're making eighteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year, um, that money is probably not supporting a family of eight, you know, ten. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you're back back to your your comment earlier about about you know Micronesian culture and community and relationship and so on. And it's 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 definitely a, a, a different way of life. I mean, I know I spend a fair bit of time in Cambodia, and I a, f a few years ago on a trip, I, I remember getting into a conversation with somebody about. Uh, about what we do to our parents here in the West, you know, you know, what do you, what do you mean you put them in an old folks home? You know, that's, right. that's absurd. That's not the way you treat your elders. That's not the right. And yet that's right. kind of what's accepted. I mean, so, so there's, there's just this different understanding of community. And I, I think anyway, and, uh, and yet, you know, on some level we're, we're all pretty much the same. It, se it seems to me, Hey, what, to what degree is Island soldier about, um, Nathan, about human rights? I mean, or is it is it yeah. about Micronesian human rights, or couldn't you say there's more of a global sort of picture there? Um, before we jump onto that, can I say one more thing? Yeah, about Micronesia? of course, yeah. Um, I, I just feel like we're going to move on from the subject of why why the military, sort of the, the motives in that experience, and I think one one last thing I I think is important to sort of understand in terms of their experience is that in a place with nothing, like family is everything. Like mm -hmm. I would guess, you know, in Cambodia, you know, families are tight knit, maybe like Mic Micronesia, they're kind of living in close quarters, kind of sharing, sharing everything. And, and I think that that, that closeness is also what makes it so hard to have, you know, family members go mm -hmm. places that are, you know, geographically, you know, far flung, but also, you know, a flight is a flight to Mic Micronesia can be three thousand, four thousand dollars. You know, depending on when you get it, so it can kind of be ex too expensive to ever to, to sort of regularly reconnect with family. And I think well, that's, so out, so that's out of so out of reach for most Micronesians, right? And so out of reach. Yeah, so out of reach. And then also the other thing that really struck me that so beautifully comes out in your film is just. The, the, the tight knit family, uh, the, the, right. the, that core, that, that excruciating scene of, of the father leaving. And, and for me, it was excruciating. Anyway, I have a young daughter and a young son, nine and 11 and thinking, wow, how, how do folks do it? How do, how do people, you know, how do you, how do you justify that? How do you come to, come to terms with that? You know, that, yeah. that whatever it is, that nine month tour, you know, it's, uh, wow. It's just uh, the, the choices we make, you know? Yeah, and I mean, I, like, to, to, to go to your question about human rights, I mean, I think there's, you know, I was, before I started making the film, I was uh, at, at the house of a, of a Micronesian friend, and his, his son had been in the military hmm. and had died, died while in service. Um, not, he was not killed in action, but sort of died through 
you know, events that happened in the military. Um, and his father had erected kind of this shrine for him back in the island, hmm. really kind of nice little house with like all these flowers, kind of a cultural a thing you do in Micronesia for someone who's passed. Right. Building sort of a, a house is not un, unusual, but this VA officer w- had been traveling through Micronesia and he came to dinner and we, we were talking and, you know, he was like, look, these guys are not getting what they're entitled to. They're, they're, they're just not sort of, because this is not America, they're, they're too far away. They're not kind of getting their, their due to benefit. Right. And that was a really interesting moment to me because that was like coming from someone, I mean, granted, he was, he was working for the VA and he was like looking into this stuff, but, but to have that, that wasn't a question I asked. He kind of volunteered this sort of, before I had been really thinking about that as a, you know, as a theme for the film. And I think that hopefully that that resonates. And I think in a, in a simple way, you know, I think there's, there's things about the film, about enlistment, about service. And I think, you know, it's hard to be super black and white. You know, at some point when I was living in the islands, I realized I probably would have enlisted too. I, I probably mm. want, would have wanted that paycheck, would have wanted sure. to like support my family. Yep. Um, and I really wanted the, the film not to be anti, not, not to sort of misrepresent kind of that experience of these people and their motives. Um, but, but I think that the thing that to me is pretty black and white is the fact that these people, you know, some of these people I've interviewed have done five, six, you know, a lot of deployments over the, you know, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan and Somalia and, you know, any number of kind of dangerous places. Mm-hmm. And I think the fact that they kind of come home, they're, they're kind of, they're recruited from their islands and they come home and they don't have access to the healthcare benefits to loans, to, you know, various benefits that that's kind of what you're earning with your blood, right? Right. As an American, you're like, sure. you know, you're not going to get paid that much, but you're going to get these kind of advantages down the line, that which can hopefully help you kind of build your life after your military service. <clears throat> and I think that that's, to me, a clear kind of human rights uh, issue in the film, is that, that if, if the U.S. was going to, recruit these people, um, especially most of them have been serving and really dangerous. A lot of them are infantry, a lot of dangerous situations. There needs to be some thought put into like what happens afterwards, you know, like, so it's, how so, do they, so, so, in a, so in a, in a way it's, it's, uh, hmm. I was going to say it's a, it's a wake up call. It's not really a wake up call for the military or for the government, the U S government, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, hmm. It's a film about, you know, clearly an issue that needs to be attended to and, and probably not just in Micronesia or is it, is this just, is this kind of a one-off? No, I mean, I, I, I actually, I don't know if a wake up call is the right thing to call it, but you know, the film, uh, <laughs> not to spoil the film, uh, or make you not, not make people not want to watch it, but there's, it opens with a funeral, right? Yeah. Right. Um, yes. Yes. So can I? I guess we can leave that. Oh um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But uh, at the funeral, I was, I was talking. The general had kind of come in for the funeral, which was actually a pretty great show of respect. Um, and it was, you know, the people, the the mother, uh, the soldier was really kind of, you know, floored. And I, I think her her appreciation kind of gets at a certain modesty in the people too, which I think hopefully comes across in the film mm-hmm. that these, these people are not. They're not activists. They're not no. demanding. No, demanding things from people. They're they're kind of that's not their their culture. It's not their vibe. Um, but I was talking to this this general who had come in to kind of give a speech, and he he was like floored by the number of veterans who were coming out for this funeral. Hmm. Um, and obviously, like most of the population of the island, came out for this guy because they all either knew him, were related to him. Or in general, we're just like, you know, this is like a thing for our island, like one of our right our sons. This, is, this is, is what we do. This is what we do, but but also we should show respect. You know, this is it's, it's a culture also around kind of 
veneration and kind of sh- showing respect to people who who contribute to community because that's kind of the most important thing there. So this this guy's funeral was a big thing, but this general, you know, after the you know at the funeral we were chatting and he was saying, I, you know, I really want to look into this when I get back because I had no idea that the people from these islands mm. were serving as these rates. And so I think, you know, I don't. I don't know that that many people within the U.S. military would actually know. You know, I, th- I think the recruiters who go there have a you know have a good idea, and there are a number of people. And I think that a lot of veterans and, and people in the military have served alongside Pacific Islanders, and you know whether they're from Micronesia or Samoa or Tonga or you know Hawaii would kind of like have. I would hope the film would sort of resonate with them because I think the characteristics that made someone like Sapporo, uh, one of the characters, a good soldier, those are characteristics that kind of are culturally built into these mm. people. Um, but yeah, I mean, the the geopolitics are also an, a part of the film and the fact that the relationship with the U.S. and the funding from the U.S. are are kind of up in the air right now. Sure. So, so the Federated States of Micronesia is a country that depends almost entirely on U.S. aid, um, which is kind of given in exchange for military control of this vast, you know, million square mile swath of the Pacific, which is important for U.S. strategic uh, interests. But that, that agreement is slated to end not too long from now. And so I think, you know, another point of the film would be what what do we owe these people and this country? And I think kind of a way of thinking about it from the Micronesian perspective that that I came to um, was reading about there's other islands in Micronesia called Yap that have the largest money in the world. Uh, there's these huge like limestone um, rings that that are quarried from from other islands. And anyway, it's a really interesting thing, but a tangent. But uh, but that's one major island, and then there's a bunch of smaller islands. Right. And each year, the people in the smaller islands put together this tribute, send it to the main island. So when their island, their, their smaller island gets hit by a typhoon, when their crops get wiped out, and they're kind of like destitute, they can like sail into the main island and be welcomed and have the people there you know, say, stay as long as you need. And then, you know, when you're ready, go back and start life on your island. And I think, you know, to me, Micronesians sending their young people into the U.S. military is an offering. It's it's like what they have to give to this, like, larger country. Right. right. Um, and it, it, these are, like, the valedictorians kind of, these are not, you know, military service, in Micronesia is, is different than it is in the U.S. I feel, you know, pretty, pretty clear to say that. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I think like w- what the, the relationship is going forward and what, and what U S what the U S kind of owes to these islands is, is a question. And um, I think there's, this is also not really a part of the film, but there is also a certain stereotype in places where Micronesians have been migrating to, like Hawaii and Guam have been the, the two kind of bigger places where Micronesians are kind of like these these people who come with their hands out and, and look for handouts and aren't sort of giving to the to the community they're, they're moving into. Um, and it's a complicated thing. And, that, you know, there is there are people moving and not sort of having, you know, jobs lined up and, and there is, there is, there are problems, but I think, I hope the Island soldier also presents a, a counter narrative sure. of, yeah. of the way these immigrants, because it's, 
it's an extension of how immigrants are looked at anywhere, right? It's like the new. Oh, absolutely. Well, that's, I mean, that's, and that's what I'm always looking for in, in films like this is, yeah, sure. It's about a, a specific, I mean, I mean, the film is about so much more than what the film is about, if that makes any sense. Right. And, mm, and I think I so. that's, I mean, I, yeah, no, for sure. And I, and we're going to have to wrap it up here in a sec, unfortunately, but I, but I too, I think, you know, you really speak to that in the way that you, you know, sort of the epilogue, almost the wrap up, what, what, the, there, there are other opportunities. There are other things going on. We got there's a sustainable farming business happening. There's a hip hop clothing business being opened. You know, I just right. I really right. love that. You know, the what was the line? Uh, the future of development in this country will depend on right or and yeah. And there's just, it, 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 it's about what's, our young people coming back. Yes, it's about what's next, right? It's about opportunity. It's about the future, and and I think that's yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful film, Nathan. I hope I hope the hmm. I hope everybody gets to see it, but I hope the right people get to see it, and 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 I hope you can continue to create the conversation uh, around this. You know, you say it's 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 a question, but I think the film raises a lot of really uh, not only interesting questions, but really important questions about about uh, about uh, human rights, about about PTSD, about mental health issues, about about trauma, and and all of that, and 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 about community. You know, and and again, it's it's a it's a great film, and it's it's just you've you've covered a lot of ground. So so thanks for that. What's um what's next for you guys? Uh, thank you so much for for having me on and uh, talking about the film. Um, I'm actually not <laughs> at liberty to kind of talk about our <laughs> nice our next our next festivals because we're like negotiating. Oh, uh, good for you. We have, we have some other festivals and you know in a, in a personal sense and for for me and my collaborators on the film um i would you know acknowledge this film has been a collaboration sure um i would say we're extremely excited to kind of take it to the pacific and have those screenings and yeah, you know it's yeah it's, it's incredible to to screen it in the u.s and in canada hot dogs um and i think it'll be really great to also bring it back to the people we're kind of representing and you know, hopefully the film can really open up a dialogue there around some of the issues that, that the film addresses. Well, thanks for your time today. We're talking to Nathan Fitch about his new film, Island Soldier. Uh, check it out online at islandsoldiermovie.com. Nathan, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. This is incredible.